Hi, good afternoon, students again. And this evening's class will be split into two sessions. The two sessions, as I highlighted, between 5 to 6.15, we'll be doing CSEC 2016 password pass. We'll be doing solutions for paper one. And between 6.15 to 8 o'clock, we'll be doing the IGC worksheet, which I've posted. Both of those are posted on the WhatsApp group chat. Um, so I'll be working on them this evening. So if you um as an IGC student do not want to stay in your classes up to you however for the CSEC students um we'll be doing paper ones with you all now um all CSEC students you know we have four students we will be for one 15 minutes to do um, the paper and just after that the IGC students um we'll be working on the worksheet IGC worksheet A which starts back from your term one work Right, um, says so up to one from sitting and for the class, you can also start by GC students who can only work sheet that was started for tonight. Good, so we start with the um, with our CSEC um, questions, and the first one is as follows um, for CSEC students, we are working the CSEC physics June 2016 paper. Next week, we'll be doing 27 following the 2018, and I'll see if I get 2019 and so forth. So Question one here on the past paper says, item one refers to the following graph. So we have a graph with one, two, three waveforms here. We have different points in the waveform. We are asking you which of the following pairs of points are in phase. What are in phase here are in a P1, P and Y are in phase, but we do have that as an option. There is also R and S is not an option. R and T which is not an option. There is also S and B, which is an option because they are same position in the waveforms, good? So there is S and V, which your answer is C for them, good? So number one is C. Moving on. Everybody okay with us so far, especially at GC students? Number two. Um, Given that force is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration, the unit for of force could be written as so. I'm going to do whiteboard fit on this one. We get this. Um, so force is mass by acceleration. Mass is in kilograms, and acceleration is in meter per second squared. So if you multiply it, your your unit should be kg. M S minus two. Good, which is if we go back, if we go back to our to our answer sheet, it would be D. So your answer for number two is D. Kg M S the power minus two or per meter square. All right, I'm number three. The SI unit of temperature is the Kelvin. However, most of the instruments now are standardized using um, degree Celsius because it is much easier for us to read. However, when performing calculations in temperature, I explain to you all that it would be in Kelvins. All right, once it, once it perform a calculation. Number four, in carrying out an experiment to locate a real image using a con Emerging lens, the object can be placed between the focal point and the lens at the focal point or between the focal point and a point twice the focal length. We talk about for convergent lens. The key word is convergent lens here, and you want it to be real. If you go back to our notes, I'm just going to get our notes so you can see. Yeah. Um, All right, so you want a real image. Um, I'm just gonna share this. Um, so for a real image, for your real image, so for real images, 
it must be between f and to f where is the between f and to f or beyond to f so for real objects if you go back to um, your question for real objects it must be between the focal point and the point at twice the focal length so the answer should be number three which is d three only is d since it's d for that then i guess highlighting some key points here so when you're looking at especially igc students um cxc students sorry when you're looking for it you will see um there's a notice up for igc students your classes um working on the passive now will be between 6 15 to 8 o'clock and that's for the worksheet that has posted in the group chat and the whatsapp group chat for for now we are doing the um this is the cx the cx we pass it by 2016 paper one for the cx students okay number five the moment of force may be defined as and force is a turning effect and how you find moment of force moment of force is force by perpendicular distance so moment of force is equal to force by perpendicular distance all right and to get your perpendicular distance we know that's the formula so your answer should be here for number five should be see the product the product of the force and its perpendicular distance from the turning point of the force again and for the people who just came in, we are working on a CXC pass paper until 6.15. After 6.15, we'll be working on the IGC, which is that I have submitted to you on the WhatsApp group chat. You can start it, but meanwhile, so we come on class start um, from 16 and just uh, to the solutions. Then, then, so as I say in for this question here, they ask you what is moment of force. Moment of force is force by perpendicular distance. Perpendicular does draw why I draw a right angle triangle. That means it must be the perpendicular distance between the force and the fulcrum. So this is the perpendicular distance here between here to here. Alright, so this is the distance and this is your force to apply downward at this point. That's what we mean by moment of force. Then, nice. So we're going into number item six. So item six refers to the following diagram, which shows two forces x and y. So the both of them going in the same direction, apply onto an object. They ask you, this is like two weak fellas pushing a door. They ask you what should be the magnitude and direction of the two force that will cause the object to be remain stationary. You don't want us to move. So what you're going to do, you're going to apply a force in the opposite direction, which would be the strength of these two guys, x and y. So your answer should be A is equals x plus y in the left direction. Why you want it in the left direction? Because if these two push and they want something to oppose them, the same strength to oppose them, so that they don't move. Then, and that's your answer for number six. Number seven. When a force is applied to a spring of original length L, the new length becomes length plus the extension, X is an extension. What would be the new length of the spring if a force of half was applied instead? So, We would have flown through hooks, so force is directly proportional to length plus extension. Um, this is the extension here. Well, I'm going to put out the equal sign here. Again, it's directly proportional. It should be proportional. The extension is, is it x or 
is x, sorry. So I have it, um, wrong there, sorry. So they said that length is directly proportional to the original length plus the extension, which is x. They're saying if you only apply half the force, now what do you think will happen? It is directly proportional to the original of length of the string plus now half of the extension because the extension is not going to be the same. Good, because the extensions differ based on the force. So you come like you're putting less weight on the spring through the force, and that means your extension is going to be half the amount. So your answer should be L plus X over two, which is, let me see. Your answer is D for that, good. So pay attention to that. All right, so answer is D for that. That's number seven, number eight. For the people who just came in, there's a notification saying that between 5 to 6.15, we're doing the CXC 2016 pass paper question and solution. And for IGC students, we start from 6.15 to 8 o'clock. There's a worksheet that I had submitted, IGC worksheet E. That would be starting from the beginning of time. And if you can start working on that, so when we come on from 6.15, you all will get the um, solution screen. Nice, number eight. Item eight refers to the following diagram, which shows three forces of magnitude L, M, and N, all in the same plane and applied to a ring. So this is the ring here, L, M, N, pull in here, and you put N in the opposite direction. Which is the, the equations that must be true in order for the ring to remain stationary? The answer is this here, which is, it comes from, Pythagoras' theorem, because if you go to draw a line here, if you go to draw a line here, all right, then this line must be equal to this here, which is the hypotenuse, and hypotenuse says that that the hypotenuse squared is equal to the adjacent squared plus the opposite squared. This is your adjacent here, this is your opposite here, and this is your hypotenuse here. Then, so we're using, we're using hoops, um, no, oh, sorry, Pythagoras' theorem for that. And that's how we come up with that answer again. So n squared is equal to L squared plus M squared. Two forces of 8 Newton and 10 Newton cannot give a resultant force of 1 Newton. In opposite directions, they minus. In same direction, they add. And if it forms a triangle like this, you would get squared minus, um, plus the next one squared, you would get 9 when you find the square root. So it's 2 because they're in opposite directions. I'm going to go back and show you white board. Right, so you have two same, you have um, 8 Newton, 10 Newton. When you're doing addition of vectors, addition of action vectors means that the 8 plus, the 8 plus 10 in the same direction, same direction, you add them, so it'll be a longer line and you would have 18. This is for addition. Subtraction, when you subtract now, it will be in opposite direction, so 8 Newton, and the one in the opposite direction will be 10 Newton. Your resultant would be direction of the larger one, and you minus the two of them, you will get two, 2n. So you have 18 and 2. And if you have them in directions like this here, now we have eight, 10 Newton, 8 Newton. You want to find the resultant between this point here. So you'll be 8 squared plus 10 squared, square root of that, and you will get the answer which is nine, so I'm around nine. When you get nine, those are the answers that you could get. However, they don't want which one you don't want. And the one that you don't want is one because you can't get one in the way, okay? So this one is a subtract here.
this one's R and this is finally result and this one resultant. Good. So that's how we arrive at everybody who came in that part so far. Nice, moving on. So number 10 now. They said item 10 refers to the following graph which shows how the displacement of a runner from a starting line varies with time. So at 12 meters, he took 50 seconds and at 24 meters, he took 10 seconds. If you notice, see a runner at the same speed, nothing changed. So this is a uniform speed. Asking all from the graph here, from the graph, it can be de de deducted that a, that a runner is not moving though he's moving because he's covering distance over a particular time. He's going at a steady speed, which is what he's doing. He's neither going faster nor slower. So your answer for this is 10 is B. He running at the same speed. If it was faster than your, then your curve might have started to peak like this. Then, so you're not doing it. He's just running the same speed, so continue the same um, gradient. Then number 11, the block is allowed to fall freely towards the ground. As it falls, the gravitational potential energy, what happens it? Remember when we did energy, we said that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but is converted from one form to another. So we go from potential energy, which is where it was in the sky, and when it let it to fall, when it move, moving energy is considered as kinetic energy. So your answer should be it is converted to kinetic energy. Good? So number 11 is D. Number 12. Two, two smooth spheres, spheres A and B collide head on. Which of the following statements is or are true? The momentum of A is the same after collision as is before. Momentum of B is the same after collision as it was before. And the total momentum of A and B is the same after collision as it was before. The law of conservation of momentum states that um, the total momentum before collision equals the total momentum after collision. So your answer for that will be number three. Number 12 is number three alone. So your answer is B. Again, they may not have the same momentum. Moment, the car in A and B may not have the same momentum before and after. Then in, as individuals, when they collide together, then they will have. All right, um, number 13. Item 13 refers to the following diagram which shows two vectors of magnitudes A and B represented respectively by 0A and 0B. So 0A is on this line, 0B here. They ask you to find the resultant. The vectors O are directly perpendicular to other. Which of the following pairs represents both the magnitude and resultant, which is the trying to find between O and C? They're asking you to find between O and C here. So to find between O and C, you're going to use Pythagoras' theorem again, which is um, hypotenuse squared is equal to opposite squared plus adjacent squared. And if you want to find hypotenuse, which is this line here, which is this line here, we would use the square root. Okay, when I carry a square cross equal sign, it becomes a square root. I'm gonna show you that on the whiteboard so you have an idea. Right, so we know that Pythagoras' theorem hypotenuse squared is equal to opposite squared plus adjacent squared. We want to find hypotenuse, which is your resultant. So hypotenuse, you carry the square cross equal sign, it becomes a square root. So it's going to be opposite squared plus adjacent squared. So in this case, it's going to be C is equal to the square root of A squared plus B squared. C is a hypotenuse. Um, so if you draw this triangle here, if you draw this triangle here, between here to here would be A, here would be B, and here would be C in your in the, in the rectangle that they have. Good. 
Sí, sí, en Soledad Gibraltar. Nice, so moving on. All right, so the question here, number 14, number 14 says, the height of a liquid, height of liquid in a vessel is H, and its density is rho. If the atmospheric pressure X and the acceleration due to gravity is G, what is the pressure on the base of the vessel? So the base of the vessel will accumulate two things. Going back to your whiteboard for you to see. Would accumulate two things. Just say a vessel here. So you would have the liquid and you would have atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is X. I'm going to put atmospheric pressure here. And inside that, you would have the pressure of the liquid. And we would have learned this that the pressure of the liquid is P is equal to rho, which is density by height by gravity of the liquid. Atmospheric pressure is whatever value it is. So um, in this scenario, the question has used it as, as X. So we're going to call this X. So you must add these two pressures, X plus P, when they give you a total pressure, which is the total pressure of the liquid at the base of the tank here. Good. So if we go back now. Right, so if we go back here to our notes now, to our thing here, X is the atmospheric pressure plus the density by gravity by height, which is the answer should be C, number 14 is C. Then, number 15, the specific latent heat of vaporization of water is 2.26 multiplied by 10 to the power 6 joules per kilogram. When 0 0.1 kilogram of water is converted into steam. So we are asked to find out what happened, what is the energy. Right? So we're going back to our white screen. I've waited long this on the whiteboard here. Who needed ECT students in particular? I can reply because I need to know to move on. We are trying to fit two sets of articles here into the session. Good. Nice. So, how are we going to find energy? Energy is equal to M by L V O L F, right? It's V vaporization because we go from water to steam. Your mass is 0 0.01 kilogram. And your, your L V is 2.26 multiplied by 10 to the power 6 joules per kilogram. So kilogram units will cancel. So when you work it out, you're going to get 2.26 multiplied by 10 to the power of 4 joules. If you go towards if you go from water to steam, would you be absorbing or giving off heat? Hmm? Anybody? You can message me in the group chat. I don't know that's number. Um, when you're going from water, when you are converting from water to steam, would you be added? Would heat be absorbed or would it be given off or released? Good. So your answer for number 15, it would be, remember you're going from water to steam. So that means you need to have some water and to do in order to do a molecular change, a phase change. So your answer should be, it absorbs 2.26 multiplied by 10 to the power of 4 joules. Then number 16. So everybody understand how we do the calculation and just gonna share back. 
using standardized formula E H is equal to M by L V, where your mass was the 0 0.01 kilogram and your L V was 2.26 multiplied by 10 to the 6. When I do the calculations, it would end up at 2.26 multiplied by 10 to the power 4 joules. And you need to know if when we go from water to steam, there's a phase change, you will need to absorb energy in order to cause that phase change. Good. Nice. We're going up again, number 16. A body weighs 60 newtons on earth. When taken to the moon, the body weighs 10 newtons. Which of the following would be the main reason for this fact? The moon rotates more slowly than you. The earth rotates more slowly than the moon. The earth has a larger mass than the moon. Or the moon is no atmosphere. For sure, we know about this. So number two is correct here, which means that your answer would be number two only because why the earth has a larger mass than the the moon. Good. Is the reason for carrying the object. Larger mass would mean that it would have a lesser a lesser gravitational pull on the object. So that means the weight itself would be less. Good. So number two, number 16 is B. Number 17. The item 17 refers to the following diagram of the clinical thermometer. So this. All right. All right, so when we um, when you check here, here's 35, here's 37. Here's the T8, somewhere around here is the T8. And then you check it, you will get around to T8.8 is your answer. Again, you can check the increments and you will see it's the T8.8. So number 17 is the T8.8. Number 18, under what conditions may we apply the following formula to solve problem? This is something called the combined gas law. And for that, for that, your mass of the gas must be constant, for sure it must be constant. So we know that for sure. Um, another important thing is that the units must be same. You cannot do calculation a unit, your units are the same. So you must convert all units to the same. So pay attention to that. So your answer should be one and three, which is which is which is one and three and which is number C. All right, which is C. The answer is C here, one and three only, so number 18 is C number 19. Who is responsible for arriving at the conclusion, at the conclusion that measured amounts of electrical energy, mechanical energy can be converted to proportionate amounts of energy of heat energy? That is the law of conservation of energy. What is the unit for energy? People with the energy for unit for energy. We just did it. We did the um, calculations here. Who what is the unit? Where is this unit here? We call us J. Anybody have any idea? Jules, good. So your answer is Jules as the person who, who figured. That's good. That figured that um that mechanical energy, electrical energy can be converted to proportional amount of heat energy. Good. Number 20, which of the following method is most suitable means of heating a brass bulb in order to determine its specific heat capacity by method of mixers? Your answer is C, by placing it into a 
in the water bath for 10 minutes. So measure the temperature of the ball if I place it in water. And I place it in the hot water after 10 minutes, I measure the temperature of the, the brass ball and I can do the calculations for the specific heat capacity. When? So number 20 is C, number 21. The energy required to change the state of a substance was determined by EH, right? Which is the same formula that we just do. If the mass of the substance was double, the value of EH will be what? So let me go back here. Right, so they are saying now in this question here, if what gonna happen to EH if we double the mass? So mass multiplied by two, we doubling the mass and LV. What gonna happen, you think? What gonna happen is that you have you, you're going to double the EH as well. Because if mass goes up, your energy is going to go up. If your specific latent heat of vaporization goes up, your energy is going to go up as well. So, going back to the question here, going back to the energy required to change the state of a substance was determined to be EH. If the mass of the substance was double, the value of EH will be doubled as well. So, number 21 is B. Then, number 22. Which of the following statements is false in terms of evaporation? Um, evaporation occurs at room temperature only no, it is operated at any temperature. So that's false right away. So this here is your answer because evaporation occurs based on the liquid. Some liquids can evaporate at a lower temperature, some can evaporate at a higher temperature. Okay, so it does not necessarily mean that. Evaporation does take place on the surface of the liquid, it requires heat energy, which causes a cooling effect, and in evaporation, the faster molecules escape the liquid surface of the liquid. Number 23, most refrigerators are painted white because a white surface is a good what? It's a good reflector of thermal radiation, which means that it does not absorb heat. Why we don't want the fridge to absorb heat? Because remember, the fridge is supposed to be cooling the products. So we'll have the refrigerant in it. So your answer should be a good reflector of thermal radiation. Good. So that's why also another thing, as in most people paint inside their houses with a, with a whitish color because they do not want to, to allow heat to be absorbed into the walls of the house. Remember, the higher the heat temperature in your, in your room, the more energy they can take the air condition to cool down your room. Good? And more energy will relate to, obviously, a high electricity bill. Good? So that's why I paint most walls white. It, is all, it also gives you a better um, lighting. But that's not it mainly the real answer is because it is a good reflector of thermal radiation. Number 24, which of the following diagram best illustrates convection current? This is not convection current. This data, this data, your answer is B, because what happens with this here is that your, the cold water, the cold water rises to the, to the top, Um, when it heats up, the hot water, sorry, the hot water rises to the top. You can get less dense and the cool water, the top of the surface goes downward um, to get heat up. And, and that's how it get convection from. Number 25. The heat from a nearby fire reaches us mainly by what? Heat through fire re reaches us by? I'm going to check it like, yeah. That we did. Good. We did this lecture recently. 
So heat by fire is through radiation. Human energy radiates through air from a fire. So the answer is true. Radiation number 25 is radiation. Most of these answers are in your handout. It's just to be toggling in between handouts um, might take up time. Good, so number 25 is radiation, which is D. Number 26, which of the following is the porous conductor of thermal energy? The porous conductor of thermal energy is going to be air. Why? Because air is going to be hard for air to contain heat. Because remember, heat is lost typically through convection current, which is from the air. Good, so they don't really keep um, thermal energy. A copper wire, if you hot a copper wire, if you hot mercury, if you hot aluminum, you retain heat for um, some time, whereas air does not because of convection currents. Good, um, 27. Which of the following description refers to both a good absorber and a good emitter of thermal energy? So a good absorber means that it must be a flat plate and emitter means that it must be Oh, let me go to the lecture for this scene. Right, so for for good um, absorbers, what's going to happen is the surfaces must a dull black surfaces are better absorbers than the shiny, and for, for better emitters, the dull black surfaces are better emitters of radiation than shiny ones. So your answer should be painted black and metal plate. Then. Number 28, which of the following diagram best represents the wave generated in a ripple tank by a small spherical dipper vibrating at constant frequency? The keyword is constant frequency, that means it repels, all the ripples, the distance from each other, it's going to be the same, and the distance we call a wavelength is going to be the same. So, your answer for this is A. Good, so number 28 is A. Number 29, these are the distances between each of these ripples are not uniform will this b and d are the same they are not uniform so your answer is a for that number 29 item 29 refers to the following diagram which shows the instantaneous profile of a wave traveling across the water surface from the information given the frequency is what they ask you to calculate frequency how we normally calculate frequency we calculate frequency from period or time good so i'm just going to show you the whiteboard here so how are we going to find frequency frequency is equal to one over time or period sorry not time period and how are we going to calculate period period is based on seconds do we have anything with seconds here showing you from this this end you, you have displacement in centimeters and position in centimeters. Since it have no seconds, your answer means you cannot find the frequency. So D is unknown because the only time you can find frequency is when you have time. You don't have time existing in that waveform, so you cannot find your frequency. Number 13. Right, number 13. Number 13, the question here says, number 13 says, the range of frequency detectable by the normal human air. So we go into our lecture again. Um, you'll see where it is in the lecture. Normal human air detects between a range of 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Audible range of humans from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Good. So that's what they actually am looking at, which is B. 20 hertz, 20,000 is the same thing as 20 kilohertz. Good. Kilo means 1,000. Number 31. Item 31 refers to the following diagram, which illustrates the side view of a water wave. So this is a ripple and attack. The amplitude of the wave. Amplitude means the top part of the crest from the undisturbed portion. Good. So 
you understood portionals from here. If between here to here is eight, between here and here, just the stop part is how much? How much you think the stop part is? This whole top part here, this is the top part of the wave. Four, your answer should be four, which is half the MO. So your answer is four. So number 31 is four. Number 32, an object is viewed in a plane mirror, PQ, the formation. Remember, in a plane mirror, there were three things, one of which is said that the distance of the object in front of the mirror must be the same distance as the object behind the mirror. So this is your plane mirror between PQ here. So your object is here. So the image will be the same distance. So your answer is A because it will be the same line of action with the I. So your answer is A. Here the distances are not the same. They are the same. However, your line of sight comes from the images behind the mirror. And that is wrong because your line of sight should come from the reflection of the object of the mirror. Same here. But in this one, your I um does reflection which is wrong comes from the object here d the boat and the same distance the image and the object and the same distance it's your answer is a for that number three two is a number three three refers to the following diagram from the diagram above the refractive index we calculating refractive index refractive index could find from a formula which is let me give you the formula because we did this two weeks ago. All right, I want to go. for refractive index you call it n. N is equal to one over sine c where c is a critical angle, or we can have sine i over sine r sine of your angle of incident over your angle over sine by of the angle of reflectance. Good so um, refractions right which is sine i over sine r. In our scenario here, sine i would be m. Sine i is m and sine r is n, so your answer that would be b sine m over sine n. Good, so number 33 is b. Number so moving on now to number 34. So, number 34 here, descend item 34 refers to the following diagram, which represents an object OB standing on the axis of the convergent lens L. So, this is your convergent lens L here. OE is your object, and IM is your image. Okay. They are saying that uh, if I am representing the image form, the lens is placed at the 50 mark. So you move it from here to here. All right. Sorry. Right. I am represent image form. The lens is placed at the 50 mark, which is half of it, and here's 30. They are asking you the focal length of the lenses for the image to be real, which is in this scenario, and Twice the size, it must be around 15, which would be your focal length would be around this point here. So your answer is A for that. So number 34 is A. Which is around 15, um, 15 centimeters. That's around something here. So spin a dot. Good. So that's the focal length of the lens. Um, number 25, a ray of white light tra enters the transparent glass prism. So we know the refraction going to take place like this here. We have two refraction, we're going to have a lateral displacement as well. In which of the following diagram it illustrates the disclosure of light correctly illustrated? So light spreads out to be Roy Gibb, which is our YGBIV, so it's between A and B. Which is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. 
So C and D is out of the question is refraction line. And refraction line for that would be A, which is the refract here inside the prism and then outside the prism. We have two refraction. When you go from air into glass and from glass, glass back into air. Good, so then your answer should be A for this one. Number 36. Which diagram best shows the path taken by a ray of light through a rectangular block? So we go into the glass, we have a refraction, we have a refract, small refraction in the glass, and then a, a bigger refraction outside the glass from glass A. So number 36 is for this is C. It goes into the glass, refracts slightly in the glass, and goes out. Good, so I'm say C for that. Um, here, barely have a refraction. Same thing here. So those two are going to be wrong here. Hardly. And besides here, it is uh, close to the glass. It should be away from the glass. Again. Um, so the answer 36 is C. Number 37. Item 37 refers to the following diagram. Which is displacement and dis distance from the origin. They are asking which of the following statements above the wave shown in figure diagram is or are true. Which one of them are true here? P, P Q, and R in phase. P, Q, and R in phase. No, because Q is not in phase, but P and R is in phase. So one is wrong. Points S and T are out of phase, which is true. So this statement is true here because the out of phase. And number three, the wavelength of the wave is distance P and R, which is true. So between P and R is one wave. So two and three seems to be correct. So the most appropriate um, answer, which of those two is two and three only, which is number 37. Is D. Good, number 38. In which of the following would a change be detected if sounds of differing frequency are played? So we're going back to our notes here. Um, the share. Good, so we're going to the notes. What is affected if frequency? And um, so for musical notes, um, three characteristics pitch. Is the sensation of frequency or higher frequency? It depends on the frequency of the source. So, what is going to be affected if different frequencies is displayed? It is going to it is going to alter the pitch of the sound. So your answer should be pitch, something to do with your pitch. So 38 is C. Because the amplitudes are the same, and we're talking about different frequencies. So you're going to affect the pitch of the sound of the music. Good. Number 39. Magnetic induction occurs when magnetic induction is basically think about this. You have a magnet, you put it close to a paper clip, the paper clip becomes magnetized, you track another paper clip and then you track another paper clip. What it does is put, um, temporarily magnetizes another object, which is in this scenario B, which is iron nails near near magnet become magnetized, temporarily magnetize another object. That's what magnetic induction does. So. so. And says B for that number minus B uh, number 14. Number 14. Which of the following electromagnetic waves has the shortest wavelength? Shortest wavelength, let's go to um The shortest wavelength, the shortest wavelength is here. 
and this gamma rays, shortest wavelength always have the highest frequency. So answer is gamma rays for that, which is A. So number 40 is A. Number 41 is C. Well, number 41, sorry. Which of the following, which of the following diagram shows the magnetic field between a bar magnet and a piece of iron? Remember, bar magnet, the the magnetic field goes from north to south and inside the magnet it goes from south to north. So, so we go from north to south and inside the magnet goes south to north. So north to south. So your answer for this should be 41 is C because what happens is when I go outside, I go through the iron magnet here. I just ran into a diagram. I go through the iron magnet from 3D and magnet into the south pole of the magnet. Good. So that's how I'm just show it in. So this is your magnet here. This is your um, north. This is your this is your north. This is a south. This is the iron. What going to happen is when you have the Magnetic fields are going to pass through here like that. So you're going to go in like this. Okay, this is what's going to actually happen. This is what's going to actually happen in the iron. I'm just going to label it as iron. Good. So that's how we get C because the iron just become temporarily magnetized to become another magnet in which the magnetic field passes through. That's why most of the transformers, most of the electromagnets use a soft iron because it's one of the um, easiest elements to create a magnetic field. Sure. Good. So your answer for that Hello? Everyone hearing me? Hello. All right, then. Nice, we're continuing after that was 41 or C. Number 42, the question here says, number 42 refers to the following diagram, which represents a straight wire carrying current into a plain piece of paper. 42 is the following diagram. Which of the following diagram best describes the magnetic field around the wire? Remember, we're using the Maxwell's rule and as in the right hand, so your thumb is going to face the direction of the, um, the, mag the current, which means that it facing your thumb. So once the computer and it's in a, a clockwise direction, so your magnetic field would be would be shown through the movement of your fingernails, which is D, because your thumb would be pointing into the laptop or the page. Yeah. So number 42 is D. Number 43. Um, 43 item refers to the following diagram, which shows the trace on the screen of the yeah, of an oscilloscope wired to an EC supply and a device X. We don't know what device this is. What device could, could this be that gives it only a positive waveform to allow to pass through? The only, the only device that does that is a diode because a diode only allows current in one direction, which is to give, which, which converts current from EC to DC in essence. Again, number 44. Uh, refers to the following diagrams, label one, two, and three. 
So you have three permanent magnets here. Here, which we know that magnetically go from north to south. Same here. So these three things are correct. They're asking you, you know, which of the following diagrams above correctly shows the magnetic fields created. So since all of them are correct, the answer is D1, 2, and 3. The okay, magnetic field of each are the same. For the second one, the magnetic field going to join and it will cause something called a force of attraction. Frequently not in the seat as well. So number 44 is D. Number 45, which of the following materials is most suitable for the core of the electromagnet? You just look about that. Your answer will be soft iron. Why soft iron? Because it causes it allows the channel magnetic fields through it. So number 45 is soft iron. Number 46, which of the following circuit symbols represents a fuse? Your answer is B for that here. B that's the symbol for fuse. Um, if we go back to your notes, you will see certain symbols that I've given you. About 47. But let us go to the notes page just in case. Um, Again, so electrical symbol for fuse here, if we go down to fuse, you know. we don't have any fuse here, man. All right, good, well, fuse is that symbol here. This is symbol for fuse number 47. An ammeter has a low resistance so that it can be placed, an ammeter is placed in series, so you answer between B and D. And 47 would be B because it does not want to affect the circuit or cause a voltage of a big voltage. That's why I have a low resistance. It's connected in series so that it does not affect the circuit. Number 48, an ideal transformer has a primary to secondary turns ratio of one to three. Primary to secondary. So that means your primary is one and secondary is three. Alternate, alter, al, alternating potential difference of 200 volts is applied to the primary and a resistance of 200 attached to the secondary coil. What is the current in the secondary coil? So the first thing we need to do We need to calculate, so we know that the transformer ratio, the formula, transformer ratio is VP on VS is equals to NP on NS, which is equals to IS on IP. We are asked now to calculate your secondary current. Okay, to find this, we know that transformer ratio is one to three, which is one of the primary three and the secondary. Your primary voltage is 400. We don't know the secondary voltage, so we're gonna calculate that. It's 400, right? Wait. 200, sorry. Um, so yeah, so 200, not 400. But here going to be 200. So if you're going to find Vs, when we transpose Vs is equal to 200, multiply by 300 over 1. When you transpose, it's going to be 600 volts. So that's, that's the secondary side. We also know that there's a secondary resistance. So if you want to find the current in the secondary side, take a note here. So if you want to find the secondary current now, I is equals to, we have learned this in Ohm, so I is equal to V on 
or we have a secondary voltage, a secondary current, a secondary voltage was 600, the secondary resistance is 200, 2 divided by, that is 3, um, so the answer is 3 amps, and your answer for that is, um, go back to we know it's 3 amps, your answer for that is D, so number 48 is D. Then number forty nine. Number forty nine or number forty nine question. Yes, everybody okay with the calculations that I did showing how we get the um six hundred volts and then divided by three hundred. So it's like a transformer here coming in. This is your transformer, this is your VP. This is VP, VS, where VS is connected to a resistor on this side. And this you have a supply voltage of 400, so yeah. Where I get 400 from, right? All right, this is 200 volts coming in. Yeah, now with 600 on this side. You have a resistance of 200 ohms. You divide it to get a current, which is a current of 3 amps. Then, So we're moving on to number 49. The following diagram leaves one, two, and three shows the magnetic field lines plotted by a student. Right, um, they're asking you here which of the following are correct. So we know that it goes from north to south inside, and this correct here, north to north, causes a depletion region, which is correct, and north to south attracts, which is three to one, two, and three. Here. So number 49 is D. So number 49 is D. Then number 50, which of the following VT graph best describes an alternating voltage? An alternating voltage goes from a positive cycle to a negative cycle. The only one that does that is D, even though it is in a triangular shape, they call it a triangular all um AC waveform. Um, there's also sawtooth and there's also rectangular. This one is one of the sinusoidal ones that have a clue. Alright, number 51. So answer for that one is D. Number 51. In which of the following city for the lamp light up? The answer would be for that is here. These would move because these are two diodes in the opposite direction. Batteries in the opposite direction. So this is not going to work. Here is a positive and here is a negative. So, so sorry, here is a negative and here is a positive. So that means a negative for the delivery reverse direction. So the only answer is B for this. So, because your battery is positive here, this end of the battery is positive, and here is positive. Good. So number 51 is B. <coughs> Number 52, number 52, it refers to the following diagram. Which of the following options should correct match of the component listed? Component name and its number. So this is what a lamp. So lamp is number one, good. So what is the answer here? Because lamp is one, so the easy answer. Then, there have no others that lamp are one. Number two is a fuse, number three is a diode, and number four is a resistor. Then, given the following trip table with inputs E and B and output C, the logic gate, which of the logic gate does it describe? Um, this is your NAND gate. Why are you saying NAND? But these are not on. Once it has zeros in it, you get ones at the output. Which means that is the opposite of an AND gate, which is an AND gate. Then we go back to electric, we we'll see it how we did digital electronics. Number 54. In the scattering experiment conducted by Geiger and Manson, some of the alpha particles were deflected. The explanation for this phenomenon is 
um, there were three types of particles which is in radioactive decay decay, so alpha particles, second beta, and depending on gamma, gamma was not affected from electric, mm -hmm. electric field, alpha particles, and towards the negative alpha, then towards the positive, and so forth. So they're asking here why some of the alpha particles will affect this because the nuclear charge and mass are concentrated in small well, that's because some of them defect is not all. Again, so the answer is D, number 54 is D, number 55. Which of the following cannot be deflected by a magnetic field, which I just talked about? That. Gamma rays is not affected by it because it has the highest frequency and shortest wavelength. Which of the following are definitions of the term half life for radioactive nuclear. The time taken for the activity, wait, the time taken for the activity of the given sample to fall to half the original value, that's true. That is true. Um, that's what half life is about. Well. Then, And the time taken for half the nuclei present in any sample to decay, which is true also. So one and two so far is true. Uh, it is half the average number of disintegrations per second as a wrong. So the answer is one and two. So the answer number 56 is a number 57. The nuclide 230, 234, 92 thh2 contains 90 protons. We know that is the bottom of the protons. This is, um, the bottom number is the number of protons. The top number is the number of protons and neutrons. So we want to find the neutrons in the minus so 234 minus. 90 is 144, so the answer is 90 protons and 144 neutrons. Which of the following statements describe the type of three types of emissions of radioactive substance? So alpha. Alpha is a stream of helium nuclei, which is true. We know that because it's 40. The top number is 4, the bottom number is 2. Um, so that's true. Yeah. Beta radiation is a stream of electrons that does zero minus one. Minus one is an electron. The proton transmits on it to an electron. And the turbulent gamma radiation, radiation is an electromagnetic radiation of high frequency. It is so one, two, and three is correct. Um, so the answer for that is D. Number 58 is D. So one, two, and three is the answer. So 58 is D. Number 59, which of the following scientists discovered the relationship E is equals to MC squared? We did this last week when we were doing a radioactive decay. And the answer for that is Albert Einstein created it. That um, equation, so C is the answer. And number 60, which of the following equations for nuclear, nuclear reaction is correct? Your answer is C. You go from radium to radon and an alpha particle. Alpha particle is 4, 2. So 222 plus 4 is 226. And 82, 86 plus 2, which is 88. We did this last as an example. So number 60 is C. 
So C X is still as here. Okay, would just pass the that we did so far. I will post one and a bit again so that we see it. So that's all. Good. So number twenty-five was radiation. Anything that um, especially like light and lighted fires, the sun, um, so for those things give off heat through radiation. Okay, so number twenty-five is D radiation. All right. So I will save it and post these for you all. Um, no, so that you can get it. Good, so. Right. So we're going to do now. All right, so so CIT student does it for now. So if you wish you could leave, um, I will post the other class paper, 2017 class paper. So we're going to work on 2017 class paper in a bit. Um, Mom, next week, Tuesday, sorry, P1 class paper. Um, for Shauna, you are doing paper three, and you can lace it to me, and you can start working on them, and I will um, do the corrections to you. With you individually because you really want to do in a paper tree for CSEC. Um, everybody else are doing um, the multiple choice together, so we do the multiple choice together, okay? Um, so, as you see, students, um, we're going to start the worksheet now, which is the worksheet that I have sent to you via your. your WhatsApp group drop. So see if you want to wish to leave it's up to you. If you wish to stay on well, if you stay on and learn something. Okay, it's um G Sex is enjoy evening. Um I see students welcome back again for your to today's um, evening class. So what we are doing we are doing recap or revision from last term zoo which is term one work. Um so we'll be covering three topics. We'll be doing um, length and time. We'll be doing acceleration. We'll be doing mass. And we'll be doing forces. So those are the four topics we're going to be doing today um, in today's class. So just pay attention and um, we can start working them together. Again, I just, I just want to set post the solutions for everyone here. Whoever was in class or not in class today. All right, so let's give me about five minutes to um, set up myself for class. Yeah. As we could use as a study template, there were also one in 2018, the 2008, and the 2012. Those are specimen pass papers. Those are the answers on the back of them. So you could go through them and refer to the answers plus this one. So we'll be doing 2017 next week. I'm just going to post it. So we could do, we could um, start working on it so that by next it will be much easier for class.
Um, I'm just going to upload the documents to so CSEC, see then this is for you. Um, And so next week we're working on this one for CSEC. Um, so we do 2016, we do 2017, 18, 19, and so we get 20 to move forward. Okay. Nice. So. All right. So. Okay, so welcome back again, IGC students. We are going to do this worksheet here, which was carded for today's class. The worksheet is as follows. Um, again, this is prepared from last term to this term. The period, the question is as follows. The period of the vertical oscillations of a mass hanging from a spring is known to be constant. Good, a student times single oscillations with a stopwatch. So oscillation is, think about a pendulum, we go from one end to the next as a single oscillation in 10 separate measurements. The stopwatch readings were 1.8 seconds, 1.9, 1.7, 1.9, and so forth. What is the best value obtainable from these readings for the time of one oscillation? and explain how you arrive at the answer. What do you think we should do? What do you think is the best value? Hmm? Then, so. The first thing we need to do is 10 separate measurements. So we want to find a mean value for them. So how are we going to do that? We're going to add up the 10, 10 different measurements. Good. So this is our 10 measurements. So we're going to add up these 10 measurements. So we're going to add these 10 measurements and we're going to find an average or mean value of them. Good. In that way, we can find a more precise answer. So we're going to find the mean value. So, so we're going to find the mean value every time. So we're going to find 1.8. We're going to add up one value is 1.8. plus 1.9 plus plus um, 1.7 plus 1.9 plus 1.6 plus there's 1.8 sorry no 1.6 1. 1.8 plus 1.8 plus 1.9 plus 1.7 plus 1.8. We're going to divide that by the number of times which answer, which is 10, I believe. So when I work it out, wait. I'll see if I get a calculator to work that part. Anybody work it as it? When I add up the values. One point six. So somebody work it out and I get one point six, which is good. So your answer should be all right. So they say the best value. So we're gonna add it up. I just gonna double check. So everybody else could do the same thing. One point eight plus one point nine plus one point seven plus one point nine. <coughs> Plus 1.8 plus 1.8 plus 1.9 1.7 plus 1.8 plus 
we get 1.6. I pray make a mistake. I'm going to read into this. 10, 10 is a free measurement. So I divide by 10. So 1.8 plus. Right, I get 1.81. So this is what, when I work it out, this is what I get. I get 1, which is equals to 1.8. Um, e. I got 18.1. And then I divide by 10, so I get 1.81. So that's your, your average answer. So your answer should be around that. Because what we're going to do, you're going to add them up and find a mean value um, for it. So, good. So, you're going to be 1.81. Everybody understand how we get it? So, your best value should be around 1.8 in this scenario. Or 1.8. So, I'm just going to put in... So, you're going to be around... 1.81 good and why we want to do why what is the best value obtainable from these readings for the time of one oscillation I explain how you arrive at the answer explanation find the average find the average value find the average value of all find the average bar value Find the average value of the 10 separate measurements. Why we find the average value, the reason why we find it, the density. How we arrive at the answer, we find the average value of the 10 separate measurements. And why we do that is because the reason why you always find average of, of a number of different measurements is so that you can get the, the most, the least minimal error you could get. And as we try to do it, we try to reduce the amount of errors to find the average um, value, to find the average value of the 10 separate measurements. Not officially, between. The 10 separate measurements again describe how using the same stopwatch the student can find the period of oscillation more accurately how do you think we could find this because we did this already how do you think we could find the period to be much um, accurate what was the easiest thing to do normally what well, what what i would have told you on that it is easier to measure more oscillation than less. Now, so it's harder for you to measure what the time taken for one oscillation. Why? Because of the response time of the student. Because as soon as study watch, I stop it, so you're going to have more errors. The more oscillations that you time, the lesser the amount of human error. Good. So you could use the stopwatch, use the stopwatch to Use the stopwatch to use the stopwatch to take readings for five oscillations, five oscillations. Take the reading for well, instead of five, we will say ten. Take the readings for ten oscillations together take your reading for 10 oscillations together and then the next thing we do we calculate the, the time taken for one oscillation and then calculate calculate time taken 
can calculate you can take on for one solution which is a more precise answer again so we take it we use this stopwatch use this stopwatch to take reading for 10 oscillation to take the reading the reading for to take reading for the period of 10 oscillations and then calculate 10 oscillations together and then calculate the time taken for one oscillation all right, and we know the formula for that. The number of us, the time taken divided by the number of our solutions. You have had that in your notes. Um, so use this stuff for to take reading for the period of 10 oscillations together and then calculate. And then calculate the time taken for one solution. Good, and I will put on the formula for it. All right, the formula would be, I put it on the whiteboard here for you. So the formula here would be, Time for one oscillation is equal to the time taken for 10 oscillations over the number of oscillation. But what is the number of oscillations we're using? It's going to be 10 because we use 10 oscillations above, right? So your answer will be 10 there. I just put in it as the formula. All right, instead of putting 10, I'll just put oscillations by 10, by oscillations. And the value we're going to use here is 10, right? For the number of oscillations. It's much easier to do the reading like that. So time taken for oscillations over the number of oscillations. So that's the time we're gonna get for one oscillation. Then everybody understand CX students, some side students here about us and we get it. Huh? Yes or no? Good, nice. All right, so you're writing on that formula, that's why they give you Four marks, they would like to see the formula as well. And um, how we use the stopwatch. Again, the reason why we use the stopwatch to measure more oscillations is because you would have less human error and it's easier for you to calculate the time taken for one because they use the, uh, the period for 10 oscillations and divided by the number of oscillations, which is 10. Good. So that's that so far. So we good with that. So you put in a formula here. I could not write it in, so yeah, I have to do that in your sheet again. Number one, now moving on. Define acceleration. If we go back to our notes, I'm going back to the notes so you can see it. Yeah, so motion with acceleration. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity so that's if so that's what we're gonna define acceleration acceleration is the rate of change of velocity like explain any symbols in your definition but we are not symbol here rate of change of velocity again and that's by the longer the definition he had, it is free to remember. Okay. So, continuing here. So, everybody understand the definition here the rate of change of velocity. Nice. Figure 1.1 shows the graph of speed against time for a train. After 100 seconds of time, the train stops at the station. So between 40, 
0 to 40, the train runs at a speed of 25 meters per second. Between 40 to 100, it gradually decreases to 0. Calculate the distance for the time interval between 40 and 100 seconds. Calculate the distance traveled by the train. So if you notice here, this is the form of a triangle. This whole portion here, 40 to 100, and I go from 0 to 25. So. We're going to calculate distance. So distance is the area of a triangle. Distance is the area of a triangle. Then and how are we calculating the area of a triangle? The area of a triangle is base by height divided by two, which is the same thing as seen um, your speed. Multiply by your time divided by two. Where's your speed? The speed we went from zero to, to 25. I'm going back to the, the, the paper. So we go back to the paper here. So speed is between here to here. So we go from zero to 25. So zero to 25, and then we went from 40 to so zero to 25 here. And then from 40 to 6 to 100. So, so we go from 0 to 25. So it's going to be 25 minus 0 multiplied by 100. Minus 40. And those two values are going to be divided by 2. 0 minus is 25 multiplied by 100 minus 40 is 60 divided by 2. 225 multiplied by 60 is how much? And divided by 225 multiplied by 60 divided by 2. Once all again. Right, 750. So 750 and your unit for distance is in. If you check back, you know, if we go back to the lecture here, your time is in seconds, but your speed is in meter per second. So that means your unit going to be in meters because seconds will cancel. So you're going to be in meters. So 750 meters. So that's the calculation for that part of the question. Everybody understand how we get it? IGC students in particular. Nice. So we're moving on here. So we calculated this in travel by train. They said now the train stops for 80 seconds. And then accelerates to titty. Um, accelerates to 30 meter per second with an acceleration of 0.6. It then travels at constant speed. Complete the graph for intervals 100 to 280, showing calculations in this space. All right. So this is our graph here. So this here, it's up for 80 seconds. So for the next 80 seconds, so at, at 180, just go flat line here. Good. So I'm just going to show on my whiteboard how it will look like. So this was the, um, the graph. So here's 25, here's 0, here's 40, here's 100. So we went to this point, then we went here. Then, so here's 180. So it will go flat line like this for 180. Then after that now, the next thing they said that how in the question. You go to the question. So right, then accelerates 30 meter per second. Good. 
So it goes up to 30 meter per second at an acceleration of 60 meter per second squared. So how are we going to find? So this is your speed, your 30 meter per second. This is your acceleration. We want to find out what time it takes to reach 30 meter per second. Again, so how we're going to find that is So 30 is some up here, right? So here's 30. Here's 30. Somewhere around here, it could be up, going up to. Good? We don't know. Because we still have to find the time. So we know that the acceleration is 0 0.6 meter per second squared. And your velocity is 30 meter per second. They are asking us now. Let's make sure I had the values correct. Um, so the velocity is 30 meter per second, acceleration is 0 0.6. It travels, it then travels at constant speed after that time to 280 seconds. So we want to find a time. We're finding time. We know that acceleration and velocity over time. So if Right, if acceleration is velocity over time, then we want to find time. So time is velocity over acceleration. So you're going to be 30 divided by 0 0.6, which is how much? How much is the time you're going to take? Which is, how much did I get? 30, 50, good, nice. So we get 50 here. So it will be 50 seconds. So for the next 50 seconds, so 50 plus 180 is how much? 50, 180 plus 50, which is 230. So we're going up to 230 here. So your your graph is going to look like that here. This will be a, oh God. All right, you're going to be a straight line graph till it reaches 230. So you're going to be 30 at the top and 230 because of the time. And then for the next until 280 seconds, which is another 50 seconds, it will go flat line, which is here. So your yeah, answer would be like this. Yeah. This here graph would look something like that. So in total, it had 280 seconds. The first 40 to 100 was given. Then this is from 100 to 80, the train is stopped. So it's stopped to take a rest. So it went for 80 seconds taking errors. So that's why I ended up to 180. Then from 180 to 230, it accelerated at 0 0.6 meter per second. And it went to a velocity of 30. That's why we draw an extra line above here, this line. So we had to calculate the time it takes to go from, from stop to, to a velocity of 30. So when we calculate the time, it went 50 seconds. That's what this 50 seconds was. So calculate this time to know when it went, when it leave from zero to 30. And, and the time was 50 seconds. So we take 50 seconds between the period to retreat 30 meter per second. And then they said it went constant speed. So that means it didn't accelerate. So you just draw a straight line here. Good, so that's the calculation. Just so in, I'm just gonna show you back it. So you can make sure and take down. You want to draw over that onto your graph. So using the same graph sheet, if you have asked for that question, then you draw it over on it. So that you're correct in that. So this is round your graph. Eh? Just show you that. Good, so everybody will be with us so far. See, so I'm gonna have to continue. Nice, we're moving on. Next question. Now. The question here says 
A stone falls from the top of a building and hits the ground at a speed of 32 meter per second. All right. The air resistance force on the stone is very small and may be ne neglected. Calculate the time of fall. So this is your velocity here. And you want to find out time. How we calculate in time? We just did the formula. We can go back. Yeah. We just did the formula here. A is V on T. So we're going to see how we use it. So, if you want to find acceleration as velocity by time, I ask us to calculate the time. So, T is velocity over acceleration. What was the velocity they gave us just now? The velocity that they had given to us was thirty-two meter per second. So that's what we given so far. So we know that is thirty-two meter per second. How we find acceleration? Because Important thing to note here, because the question says that the air resistance force, the air resistance force on the stone is very small, is negligible. So the stone falls from the top of a building. So that means it's a free falling body. And when it's a free falling body, we know that acceleration is due to gravity. So that we know E is equal to gravity, which is, well, in our situation, we're going to use 10 meter per second square okay so we're going to use our value here so we're going to put in this value here which is 10 meter per second squared which is 32 divided by 10 we get 3.2 seconds good understand what is the acceleration is equal to gravity because it is a free falling body and because it's a free falling body it have no air resistance and so we fall because of Gravity. So acceleration is the same thing as gravity. So time is equal to velocity of acceleration in this scenario. Acceleration due to gravity. So we're going to be 32 divided by 10 to get 3.2 seconds. Everybody okay with that so far? I got a message my yes, nice stuff. So we're moving on. So this is a speed time graph, you know. On figure one, we don't draw the speed time graph of the fallen stone. Good, so the fallen stone was what? It was 32 meter per second, so you draw a line like this and it falls for a time of 3.2 seconds. So. So we had to plot the points and draw it, um, yeah. Good, so we would have 30 is 32, 32, so up here going to be 32, I'm going to draw it on my white screen, so, and all of this. so you're going to plot the graph, straight line like this, so you're going to plot the graph, here you're going to be 32 meter per second, you're going to come across at a point till you reach, how much seconds we get, we get 3.2, Seconds, so you're gonna put a point here, and you're gonna put a point where zero is. And try a straight line like this. So you're gonna be 32 seconds on the timeline, and here is 32 meter per second. 
So you're gonna have a line like this onto the graph. Make sure I draw it neatly onto the graph because I couldn't draw it neatly. Good. So your three point two should be somewhere around here, and the thirty two should be somewhere around here. There are two strokes after the um three and two strokes after the thirty. Good. I'm gonna wanna can move on from the white screen. To move on. Good. So moving on now. So the question here says the weight of the stone is 24 newtons. Calculate the mass of the stone. So the weight of the stone is 24 newtons. Calculate the mass of the, the stone. All right, so so how are we gonna calculate weight? Weight is um let me go back to a whiteboard. Okay, oh. So weight is equals to mass by gravity. Remember that we want to find our mass. So we're gonna change wrong the equation. So mass now. Is weight over gravity. Your weight was our value, 24. Your gravity is 10. We are saying it to be 10. So your mass is what? 24 divided by 10 is 2.4 kilogram. Okay. Everybody understand how we get that? Good, good, nice. Everybody understand how we get our part, right? Nice, so we're moving on. Good, so we get 2.4 kilogram here. Good, so number, number part B of the question here says, you said a student, right, a student uses suitable measuring cylinder and a spring to find the density of a sample of stone. Describe how the measuring cylinder is used to see the readings that are taken. Right, how we find a density? The density, because we are asking to, to, to determine the density of the sample stone. All right, so to find a density, okay, no, like this. All right, so density is mass over volume. So we are going to take two mass. The mass mass 2 minus mass 1 over volume 2 minus volume 1. This is the volume after stone in cylinder, after stone in cylinder, and before stone in cylinder. Okay. So we have two. Same thing with the mass. The mass of the cylinder before and after I put this two. So those are the two. We minus these two other when we calculate to find the actual density of the stone. Alright, so 
to write on this many times. Um, Okay, move on. Okay, move on. Nice. So, right, it said describe how the measuring cylinder is used as CD readings that are taken. So, fill measuring cylinder. Measuring cylinder. With, I'm just using a random value, eh? 25 milliliters of water. Fill measuring cylinder with um, 25 milliliters of water. All right. Um, place stone in cylinder. This stone and cylinder and take right now read it. So fill fill measuring so 25 milliliters of water as its initial volume reading. And place stone in measuring cylinder. In measuring cylinder with twenty five ml of water and take take its final volume reading volume reading. Minus find the difference, find the difference between two readings. So find the volume of the stone from the difference between the, the two. Difference between the, you know, I'll just write it as a formula, sorry. So volume of stone is equals to, volume of stone is equals to, final volume reading, minus initial volume reading. In. So minus the two readings to get the volume of the stone. Everybody understand how we get so far? Mm, nice. Good. The action of describe how the spring balance is used and state the reading that is taken. Measure the weight of the cylinder weight of the measuring cylinder with 25 ml of water as its initial as its initial mass reading measure weight of cylinder with 25 measure 
stone bin minus stone in cylinder It measures two and cylinder. What twenty five ML water as its final mass reading. And how are we going to calculate the so? For a uh, mass of stone equals to the final mass reading minus the initial mass reading. Okay. So that's how we're going to use the spring balance. How we going to, what formula are we going to use now? Um, density is equals to mass of stone. Right by the volume of stone. All right, and I should give it a density of this stone. Can so everybody understand how to reach that? Nice. They said now, uh, the student then wishes to find the density of cork. So just for the apparatus and the method would need to be changed. How are we gonna find the density of a cork? We remember a cork is fruit. So, So how you think we're going to use the um, the thing? So obviously we could find the um, the mass of the cork using the spring balance, but how we could find the volume of the cork? Hmm? Do you have any ideas? All right, get it along. To find the density of the coke normally, normally what you will do is that because these objects have a high density, they go at the bottom, coke have a very low density. So if you're going to place the cork in water, it will more of this place only the volume of water that this place will see, but not be able to find the density. So, so just how the apparatus and the method would need to be changed. First of all, you would need a very low density A very low dense liquid. No. All right. 
sorry. Let's add dance secret. All right, so we need to find, you will need to use a lesser dense liquid. Okay. Liquid than the cork. You want to use a liquid that when you place the cork, it will be able to um, sink. Okay, so that's all you need to do to get a lesser dense liquid. It's the same map up and everything. Just a lesser dense liquid and the cork. So the cork would no longer flow to the sink. Okay. We move it forward now. So everybody okay with that? Okay, so Next part of the question here. Um, it said, the bucket is full of oil. The total mass of the bucket of oil is 5.4 kilogram. The gravitation of each rank is 10 newtons per gram. The total weight of the bucket of oil is what? How do you find a weight? Weight is what? What is the formula for weight? We just did it. Weight is equal to. Mass by gravity, good. So that's how we find it. The mass of the bucket was 5.4 kilogram. Your gravity was 10. That's what we're going to use in our energy meters per kilogram. Kilograms cancel. So you're going to end up with meters. So 5.4 multiplied by 10, you will get 54 meters. Guess everybody who cared that part. Everybody who cared that? Uh, so we get 50 for new times there. Right. Just said here. It said that uh, it said here the bucket of oil is hung from a spring of unstretched length twenty centimeters. The limit of proportionality of the spring is not exceeded. And its length increases to 35 centimeters. What is meant by the term limit of proportionality? Limit of proportionality means that in the spring or the material being stretched between its elastic limit. All right. Um, we'll go back to our notes. So we did that in our it's Good here, which means that the limit of the extension of a spring is directly proportional to the force applied to it, provide the elastic limit of the spring that exceeded. That means between zero to E is the limit of proportionality.
So, so if it is between the mental proportionality, we are saying, we are asking here the question, what is meant I just said, yeah, <laughs> the bucket of oil is hung from a spring of unstretched length 20. The limit of proportionality is of the spring is not exceeded and its length increases to 35. What is meant by the limit of proportionality? It is the point It is the point On that is the point in All right, sorry about that. So it is the point on the, it is the point on the graph. Um, it is the point beyond Cook's law. Cook's law that is not. Limit of proportionality. It is the point beyond hoops, so that is not it is the point beyond which hoops so. Wait, sorry, it is a point beyond in which so is not true for stretching of the string. All right, so Ramos is explaining on the graph. As an experiment graph that can hook the limit of proportionality is a point on the graph that if it go beyond it, the spring would no longer return to its original position and would deform. So it is a point beyond in which hoops law, in which hoops law, it is a point beyond hoops law. All right, that is not true for the stretching of a spring. So beyond the limit of proportionality, you would have deformation in the spring, right? So good, part B of the question, the oil is poured into a measuring tank. Remember, you don't want to big set explanation. The longer the explanation, less marks again. Good, the oil is poured into a measuring tank. The empty bucket stretches the spring to its length of 25 centimeters. The force that stretches the spring to a length of calculate the force that stretches the spring. So the force here that 
treachery spring and if you go back to our notes here when we did hook's law how we calculate stretch and force stretch and force as well is your spring constant multiplied by your extension that's how we're going to find your force so ask you to calculate the force the oil is poured into a measuring tank the empty bucket stretches the spring to a length of 25 centimeters to a length of 25 centimeters so that means you have an extension of how much an extension of five centimeters because the original length of the spring was 20 centimeters here right the bucket and the oil is goes up to 35 so if the bucket is 5 then 15 is their oil so they ask you to calculate this the force that stretches the spring to a length of of 25 centimeters so force is equal so what what we know calculate force forces is in this scenario length is 25 centimeters with extension so forces spring constant by extension we do have any spring constant here so this one. All right. Good. So, from what we know, is that scaling out all of this force is equal to the spring constant by the extension. All right. Um, but we also have force is equivalent to weight, and weight is equal to mass by gravity. We have already found it to be what our first one was what the extension. So we're looking at the bucket. Plus oil. The bucket plus the oil, you had an extension of what? It went from 25 centimeters to 35 centimeters, which means that you have an extension of from a 20, sorry, 20 centimeters to 35. So you end up with 15 centimeters. Good as the extension. No, that would give you a weight of 54 kilogram. If we just calculate it to be 54 kilogram, you need both ma the mass of the bucket and the oil. Then, so we, we could use this to calculate our spring constant, which is K. So we want to find for K. So K is equal to F over X. Good. So K is equal to F, which is the weight of my extension. Over extension, your, your, your weight over your extension, your weight was how much? Your weight was 54 kilogram. Your extension was how much? 15. So when you divide that, how much you get for your constant? 54 divided by 15, 3.6. So you get 3.6. 
kilogram per cm. That is spring constant. Now we want to find the mass for the empty bucket. So we're going to calculate. We know the spring constant now, which is k. So we're going to calculate the bucket now. The empty bucket. So bucket alone. Now. So for bucket, we're going to calculate the bucket. We know that the bucket extension was what? It went from 20 to 25. So that means it had an extension of 5 centimeters, which is 5 centimeters. Good? We got a minus difference. So we're going to find the weight of the bucket now. So weight of the bucket is equivalent to the force, which is equals to the spring constant, which is k multiplied by x. x is your extension. Your k your spring constant was 36 kilogram per cm multiplied by your spring, which is 5 your extension. Cm's cancel will be 3.6 multiplied by 5. which is 18, so your answer is 18 Newton. So if your empty bucket is 18 and your full bucket and oil is 54, how much is your oil? So just be the difference, will be 54 minus 18 going to give you the oil, which is 36, again. So this is for the weight for your bucket, 18 Newton. Everybody understand how we get that? I understand how we get 18 newtons. All right, good, nice. So I can move on. So our first answer here was 18. Good. So when the spring stretches 25, there's the empty bucket. We get 18 newtons, right? How we calculate the mass of the oil? Well, we know to calculate mass of oil. How we calculate the mass of the oil? Because we know the weight of the oil already. And we calculate the weight of the oil basically by minusing it. Right? We said that the weight of the oil was the bucket. So the weight of oil so for the oil is equals the weight of the oil is equal to the total which is the bucket and that which would be 54 newtons minus the 18 for the empty bucket so one was with bucket and oil and one was it with bucket alone so it will be 36 newtons how we calculate mass? You know, weight is mass by gravity. So mass is equal to weight over gravity. Your weight was 36 newtons divided by 10 newtons per kilogram. You divide that, you get 36 divided by 10, you get 3.6 kilogram is your mass for your oil. Everybody say we get that? Who do understand? Please, so I can explain it over again. If all it needs me to. Everybody good? Nice. So good. So that's how we calculate the mass of the oil. So mass is weight over gravity. Your weight of the oil will be the difference between the bucket and the oil minus the empty bucket. So you just get the oil alone and it divide the um, by gravity. Right, so that's um, the mass of the oil. They ask us how to calculate the volume of the oil. Mass, the density of the oil. Calculating density. We just did it. Densities. Yeah. Right. So the density, density 
density we know the formula density is mass over volume the mass of your oil was yes m over vegan so your mass was um of your mass of the oil so we dealing with oil here so your mass of the oil was 3.6 kilogram and your density the volume which you give in in the question was 0 0.045 meter per cube so 0 0.0045 meter cube divided and so we get on 3.6 divided by 0 0.0045 how much will I get? And your units divided in our calculator and so I get. Good, 800. So your answer would be 800 kilogram per meter cube. And that's the typical density for any oil. The density for water is 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. And any higher density, obviously, uh, well, they will have to tell again. So 800 kilogram per meter cube is density for oil. Everybody understand how we get that, right? Nice. Excellent. So you're moving on. Right. Explain in terms of their molecules why the density of oil is greater than the than that of air. Yeah. Right. So oil. Let me just compare it to in terms of phase, phase, phase. Right. In terms of states of matter, for oil, oil is a liquid and air is a gas. So if you ask us in terms of molecules, why it is you're going to be more dense is because for liquids, your particles are arranged through, through Um, so just look and see what we did in the and that's what we have right here. Then, so one chair. So you would know, notice how the liquids and gas that the particles have a weak force of attraction, which would mean that the density would be a little higher than that of air because the particles are spread out in a random motion or very far apart. So, in terms of molecules, if you had to explain the same terms of their molecules. Why the density of oil is greater than that of air? Because, because the molecules Mm 
right because the molecules because the molecules are because the molecules of the oil are held together by held together by um, by weak forces swells the molecules of the air are held together by very weak forces. Well, so that's what we mean by that. Because the forces are so weak, so here will be 800 kilogram. Right, because because um because uh, the molecules are very strong attractor force. Why it is the solids the density are much higher than liquid is because the molecules are held together by very strong forces. So that's ten. Okay, no, no. So everybody will give it as a five. Last question. So okay, we're not done tonight, huh? Again, so everybody will give it as a five. IGC. Nice. So they said now an astronaut has a mass of 65 kilograms of eight with a gravitation of each one is 10 newton per kilogram. Calculate the astronaut's weight on E. Resulting in the Vakayasin formula. So, what we're going to do is weight is mass by gravity. Your mass of the, the astronaut at that point in time was how much? Okay. Right. So, see now. Right. So they said an astronaut has a mass of sixty-five kilogram. A gravitational field strength on Earth, where the gravitational field strength is ten newton per kilogram. Calculate the astronaut's weight on Earth. So sixty-five and ten. So we're gonna calculate. The weight. So your mass was 65 kilogram. Your gravitational field is 10 newtons per kilogram. Kilograms cancel, so you get 650 newtons. Good. So everybody see how we get that? 650 newtons. Nice, excellent. So that's how we find the um, things we're moving on. Rapid motion. We're going to finish us. Is it complete the sentence? The astronaut's weight on Earth is the is the something force between the astronaut and the is. Right, so the astronaut's weight on the Earth is the something force. What force is that? What force you think? Is the gravitational force. The 
gravitation to a solar rod. The gravitational force between the astronaut and the world. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. This shouldn't be gravitation. The astronauts wait on it is downward force. Downward as far as you The astronauts wait on it is the right, it's the gravitational force. There's a gravitational force between the astronaut. And to say this way, he said, So we get back to this part of the question here. Eh? I'm gonna so continue. So the astronaut and takes in passing, we we'll go back to that. So the astronaut and takes a moon landing on the moon, the gravitation field shrink is one way to state the astronaut's mass on the moon. So, so the astronaut mass is 65 kilogram on Earth, and when he moves to the moon, where the mass going to be the same? The mass going to be the same, which is um, how much he had there somewhere? 50, 65. His mass going to be the same. But the only difference is going to be his weight because we're using a new gravitational field, which is 1.6. So, again, if you go back to that now, going back here now, we're using the moon, I don't know the right moon. So, for the moon, his weight is going to be the same as 65 kilogram, but now the gravitational field is 1.6 meter per kilogram. Kilogram cancel with 65 multiplied by. 1.6 which is 104 so his new weight is now 104 newtons previously on earth it was 650 here it is um, on the moon is 104 then it should be 104 newton 65 nothing changed with the mass So they're asking him, or they said, let me just go back to parts and complete the following sentence. Following sentence. The astronaut's weight on it is the Right, so the astronaut's weight on Earth is the pull force, which we put down is the 
is a downward force is a downward force between the astronaut and the Earth's surface of ground, right? So the downward force between the astronaut and any downward force is caused by the gravitational field. Good. Let's take down that. So everybody okay so far with this question? We have one more. Let's take a submit. Right, so moving on. Number two, an ornamental plant. An ornamental plant. An ornamental garden includes a small pond which contains a pumped system that causes water to go up the pipe and then to run on a heap of rocks. They're like a fountain there, right? This is the height which is eight meters. This is a pump here. Density of water in one thousand three hundred meters. The volume of one liter is equal to zero point zero zero one liter. Calculate the mass of one liter of water. Don't calculate the mass. Mass is water to the bottom of the Yeah. Mass. Uh, we know that density is mass over volume. So if you want to find mass, mass is density by volume. Density is of water is one thousand kilogram meter cube multiplied by the volume. How much liters of water it is? If we go back to our numbers, liters of water, uh, one liter, one liter of water is zero point zero zero one liter cube, which is zero point zero zero one liter cube. When you work for that, how much you get the mass? Which is one kilogram. Which answer is one kilogram here. One kilogram. Everybody in the center, we get a one kilogram. Hmm? Good, nice. So moving on. Calculate the work done raising one liter of water to a height of this. Work is forced by distance. Work is forced by distance. So if you go to our form and share. So work. This is forced uh, uh, force by distance. And your force is the same thing as your weight, right? A weight multiplied by distance. Your distance, what is weight? Weight is mass, right? Gravity multiplied by your distance. Your mass of your, your water is one kilogram. Gravity we use in is 10 newtons per kilogram. And your distance was 0 0.8 meters. See it? Let me go back to here. We are raising the object. From one liter of water to a height of 0 0.8. So going up, we know that the mass of water was one kilogram. Density of water is this again. So we calculate gravity. We have gravity here is 10. Which is this year, so it will be one multiplied by 10 and 0 0.8. Don't you get 8? So answer is 8 
new terms so these two cancel new term and these new terms new term new term Chances eight here. Who can understand? Who can understand? Who don't understand that part? Who can understand? Click open data meter is the same thing as we've done. Alright. So we're going to the, the pump lifts 90 liters of water per minute. Then calculate minimum for the pump. Is equals All right, so we need to calculate the power of All right, so the 90 liters per minute is the capacity of the pump. But we need to get the power, so we get the power for is Okay. Let's to make sure. All right, so we are using the uh, flow rate here yeah, to calculate the form. We're using the formula. Here all. So the pump requirement for is the capacity, which is Q, which is the flow rate, um, multiplied by the density. Multiply by gravity, multiply by height, of which so be ninety liters per minute. Liter per minute. Multiply by a density with the thousand kilogram per meter cube. Multiply by your gravity, which is ten. Newton per kilogram multiply by a height which is 0 0.8 meters. So we're going to convert these units. So liters, which is 90, multiply by how much liter? 
in how much liters to, to, to meter cube is 0 0.01 over um, how much seconds in a minute? 60 multiply by so here could be meter cube over over seconds multiply by 1000 kilogram per meter cube multiply by 10 newton per kilogram multiply by 0 0.8 we're trying to do is standardize all the units, so we set a cancel. So kilograms cancel, we take you cancel. So when I work it out, you're going to be Twelve and so your answer will be twelve Newton meter per second, which is your power of your pump. And the power of the pump isn't really Newton meter, it's actually in wattage. So just use it as watts. Good, so it will be 12 watts, so will be a pump, sorry. So 12 watts as a requirement. Good, everybody okay with that so far? So, Last part of the question here is the um, pump is switched off. Immediately after the pump is switched off, what is the value of the water pressure at the bottom of the, the 0 0.8 meter pipe due to the water in the pipe? So I calculate pressure, pressure of the liquid so if you go to calculate pressure of a liquid, pressure of a liquid is density by gravity by height. Your density is a thousand multiplied by gravity, which is in plus ten. Multiply by a height was zero point eight meter. So your answer is in to be. Just cancel this, so you're going to be Newton per meter squared, um, which is 1000 multiplied by 10 multiplied by 0.8, which is 8000 Newton per meter squared, which is the same thing as a Pascal, which is 8000 Pascals. Okay. Everybody will give it us a fun. Get my number here. Um, if anybody wants me to run over anything before you wrap up class. Good. All right, so that was today's session. I would do next week, I would do the CSEC the students, the IGC students first, and then the CSEC. Um, I'll send your work again. And for those who, who signed up to do exam in May, June, I would keep I'll we'll get in touch with you um, probably later this week to find out how we're going to sort out marks. To sort out, we just uh, 